Okay, guys, welcome back to uh, the Fat B-Man chat. Uh, Eliza is taking the night off, so he's giving me the uh, reins to the circus here. So bear with me as we try to figure uh, all these things out there. Probably be a good time to uh, say thanks to E for all the work he does, keeping his B-Chat going, and also all the uh, everything he does on the, the Facebook page. It sure is a lot of work and goes, uh, I think, unthanked a lot of the time. So E, whenever you listen back to this, thanks for all that you do. Uh, as far as the chat, be sure to raise your hand. I think most of you guys know what to do here. If you're new, uh, look for the raise hand uh, icon there when you click on uh, chat. And when you have a question, uh, just click that button and I'll keep an eye out and we'll, uh, we'll keep everything going. Don, what are we talking about tonight? Well, <clears throat> we're going to talk about splitting. Now, splitting is the easiest thing anybody can do. But there's a way to make money at it and there's just a way to make a few extra hives. So a lot of people do a walk away split, which if you got lots of time, you're not interested in building numbers up fast, uh, you can just pull a queen out or just do a half and half divide and then you got splits. Now, if you wanna start making extra splits from that, and if you don't have plastic, you can cut cells up. Uh, the next thing uh, in the far as splitting is, the best thing to do is crowd your hive down into a single story and let them make queen cells. If you're on natural draw or wax, you can cut out each frame. Springtime will run 10 to 20 queen cells. The ones that are like single, you can cut those out easy. When you get a little practice, then you can start doing the doubles or the triples and separating them. Now, the next way and the most efficient way, which we are doing that right now. We are starting to make splits next week in our southern yard. Because we have, we've got our, our uh, starting boxes set up. We have what we call ripe cells. They are timed out to where when we pull them, they're going to hatch out within 24 hours. So what we do is take a hive. If it's got a super on there, eight frames of uh, honey, we take one frame, leave the bees hang on it. We put it in the box, put a ripe cell there it's hatched out the next day. Now, if you want to make a ton of money, I haven't done it, but I'm gonna start doing it this year. People are asking for virgin queens because price of queens is going out of sight. You can buy a virgin queen if you got halfway decent stock. You have a queen cell that's gonna hatch out in your yard in 24 hours. So you can take one hive, split it up, if you got say a 10 frame high, three boxes high, in 24 hours, you can take that box and literally make 30 splits. Because it don't take but a half a handful of bees, a couple of bees basically. We're setting up our mini nukes that way. And we will have ripe queen cells for pickup. I haven't figured out if I'm gonna ship any because they're fragile. And if they don't get out in 24 hours, they hatch out in the, in the UPS truck and you just have a catastrophe. But if people wanna pick them up, $5 gets you a queen cell in lots of 25. Now we sell them in lots of 25, 100 and 500. We will have at least 500 to 1,000 cells available per week, starting the third week in March. Cause we are taking one yard and we are splitting up and making 1,000 hives down there. Uh, we are covered up as far as uh, our nukes. Our overwinter nukes are just about gone, and the fresh nukes going out. We should have nukes going, weather permitting, third week in April. Packages will start taking care of our students, usually the, at the middle to the end of March. Uh, if you haven't got on that list, get a hold of one of my keepers. Get on Dixie B Supply. We have a list of all the keepers. Uh, they'll probably bring them up to you or get you close to them. Uh, another thing is people are talking about um, cell towers. Uh, there's a lot of uh, bogus talk out there going around about cell towers and killing bees and all this other stuff. I've had quite a few students been here and there's a large cell tower less than a quarter mile from my house. I don't have a problem. So I find that people have a little bit of information, like to spread gossip around and worry the new beekeepers. We've got enough things to worry about. Uh, and we're setting up our classes down there three days a week in our southern yard in Crawfordville. And you'll have camping available down there. 
you got a camper, you can come down there. And this is going to be some hands-on. Now, up at the yard where I live, we try to get you a little experience there doing just about everything. Down in our southern yard, if you want to pitch in and learn how to shake packages, uh, and you're going to need a bee suit because most people will not be accustomed to thousands of bees in the air around them. We'll shake out 50 or, or 75 packages in a day's time, and that's a slow day. Normally, we'll do three to 400, but when you're teaching, you have to go a little bit slower. Now, we're going to do some splitting down there. You'll be able to put queen cells in, and if you stay two, three days or a weekend, put them in one day, come back the next day or a day and a half, you can actually see the queen that you put in hatching. So we got a lot of things planned for people down there to try to get them into commercial beekeeping. So I hope we got a bunch of good questions tonight. So let's get going with the questions. Okay, who's got a question here? Check for, uh, I don't see any hands up yet. Don't be any back. questions out there? There we got Pat. Let's see here. Yeah, hey, this is okay, Leon. Pat. Um, Leon, go ahead. Got a question on the uh, one gallon bucket feeders. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, plug that you put in there, is that a uh, tent plug like they use in paints? Or is um, it just a paint I basically, I, I'm that I don't know. Stephen buys them by the thousands. Uh, but we're changing to a different size. Uh, the ones that we use are a little smaller than an inch and a half. Now, mm -hmm. the ones that Greg brought down, that's what we're switching to. We okay. went to black buckets. I personally don't like them. When they get hot, they uh, <laughs> expand and start, you know, leaking out too bad. I like the white ones. I like the uh, plugs that Greg brought down. They're a little more expensive, but I think in the long run, they held up a lot better. Mm -hmm. They're hard to source. <laughs> um, they're on the uh, information, the uh, company that uh, sells those, uh, sells them in like a lot of 2000 something box. And yeah. that's okay for a commercial guy like you, but for the <laughs> average small beekeeper, you never go through that many of them. Well, so Greg's sitting right there now. I'm sure he can sell you some. Now, he's probably got a few extras there. And he's probably got the source where you can get them. Yeah, that's uh, so. Since we posted that video, they've gotten bombarded with with beekeepers uh, looking for those plugs. Those plugs, uh, they're actually fifty millimeters, so they're just a hair under two inches. Mm -hmm. uh, they are a tent plug, T I N T. Um, yeah, paint. Yeah, they're used all across the world. Uh, you can get them from China, Japan. Uh, there's actually, uh, if you look up, uh, I think it's Deeks Brothers. There's, I think there's about four different ones of them. There's some in Florida. Uh, Georgia, there's, you know, the one near Don there is in Stone Mountain. That's usually where I go when I visit Don. I just swing down there and pick up 500 or 1,000. Um, then I believe there's one in North Carolina. So depending on the time of year, some, sometimes they have them, sometimes they don't. Uh, I, I carry, I, I do have extra. Uh, we those only plugs need about are, 50. Yeah, just if, if, if anyone is, is trying to build them, like you see in that video, like how Don's are, just shoot me a message, uh, and I, I usually have three or four hundred extra at a time, okay. so I'll be happy to, to get you guys set up. All right. Mm -hmm. Cool. One thing yeah, we got I the would say, even when we had the, the smaller plugs, is get you a piece of plywood and cut you some three-eighths by about two inch long and fill that in around the plywood, set your lid on it, and then put you about a three-inch square piece of plywood in the center and get you a good forester bit. A spade bit is going to walk around, and you need a drill press if you want to do them good. Uh, Handheld is going to walk around on you. And if you get that hole cut right and take care of those plugs, they'll last you a while. All right. Cool. Did you want yep. to ask about no, that, the other? That, that, that a little bit later on that. Okay. Cool. That answers All my right. question there. Thank you. Yep. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's see. Um, Dwayne, you go ahead. Go ahead, buddy. You're up. All righty. Uh, just a quick question, Don. Uh, when putting in packages, uh, what would be the lowest temperature you would recommend doing that? Well, actually, I've got about three or four videos. One is in warm weather, going to stay warm, and one is with weather that is halfway decent, and they're predicting the next day or two weather to drop. So I show you how to put the queen cage in, 
facing up if it's going to drop on the temperature. And if the temperature is going to okay. stay livable, put it between the frames with the screen facing down. Okay. Uh, if you put it between two frames uh, if that's drawn out comb, there's not enough bees can get there. And if the temperature drops, then they can't keep the queen warm. But if the temperature's dropping and you put it 90 degrees across your frames, the bees will actually hump up across the top of the cage three or four inches high and keep that queen warm. So okay. I've done several videos just on that subject. I just know I'd, I'd done uh, quite a few of them that was probably on the risky side, right. <laughs> but uh, I never had any problems with them. But I, there was a couple of people that was wanting some packages this spring and they, uh, they had asked me because like, well, if we're in Indiana. It's probably going to be warmer in the morning in Alaska than it is here. And April's the same way. You just don't know. But I just didn't know really what kind of temperature to tell them that was all. <laughs> If any of you that got bees ordered from us and you want to shake the packages and you don't have no experience, you come down to our southern yard there. I'm going to set a scale down there and I'm going to teach you how to fill the box and get it within an eighth of a pound so that, you know, you're going to have to do this at your bee yard. If you don't want to shake bees, no problem. You just tell us when you're going to be here and we'll load you up. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll be down there to do the shaking stuff, just just cause. <laughs> That's all I had, buddy. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay, Linda, go ahead. Okay, I want to know what uh, I want to talk about foundation. What kind of foundation do you recommend, or what does most everybody use? So I've used several kinds, but what what do you recommend? Well, you have to decide what are you wanting to do? Are you wanting to produce honey? Or do you want to produce bees? That's going to give you, a, it's just like going in your car. You don't jump in and head out on vacation. You've got to have a plan where you're going. If you're going to do cutting of queen cells, I would say unwired foundation. Okay. And if you want to make your own, um, that way you know what you got. You buy the un unwired, you don't know what you're buying. Okay. If you're going to do... Uh, Move your hives a lot and you're going to do honey. Uh, a lot of people do the plastic. Uh, the plastic's got good points. It's got a lot of bad points. The main thing with that is you got to feed a package to get them up. And if you don't put the feed to them, they're slow to draw plastic out and they're bad mm -hmm. about wanting to make a lot of drone comb or stretch cells. But okay. Stephen's got really good luck. We put a gallon of real good, like four to one, five to one syrup on there. And he could put three frames of plastic in there and they'll draw them out almost perfect in about a day and a half. Okay. But it's a hive that's got a lot of bees in too. Okay. So All right. Does that answer your question? If you want to go and make queen cells, you want something that you can cut. If you right. worry about it bagging down, you can make your own foundation the thickness you want, and then you could cross wire it with a fishing line. Well, I've been doing the cross wiring, but I've used plastic in the past, but they just didn't seem to draw it out well. And so I've been using just the pure wax, but it's got wires in it. But then that wire, I don't like, because like you said, I can't cut into it. Okay. Well, when you got the plastic in there, you say they don't want to draw the plastic or they're not wanting to draw with a fishing line. Or well, it seems wire. like they avoid they avoid where the fishing line is. It'll it'll draw to it, and then they'll skip over the fishing line, and then keep going. That's the one indication you're not feeding them. Okay. If you're feeding them. You're feeding them Kool Aid. Now that hive that you was doing that in was that the only one, or did you have several? I had several. Let's so say I how many? Five. Five. Yeah. How many pounds of sugar did you put on them? I was doing two to one when I was mixing the syrup. Kool Aid. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, what should I do? If you want to do it, I, I have videos on it explaining when you mix your syrup up, get it to where it's like peach syrup. When you pour it, it shouldn't splash. It okay. should be that consistency. Okay. You know, if if all that stuff, one to one, two to one, that really works good, we'd put, you know, we'd put 10 to one because, you know, they spend more time evaporating water. And right now, if you put too much water in there, You've got a condensation problem in there, and mm -hmm. then you're going to lose bees if the temperature drops on you. So keep okay. the syrup thicker, and they'll do better. Okay. Even honey. Feed your own honey. Yeah, I've got several hives of honey. 
or yeah. frames, I mean. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay. Hubert, you're up. Go ahead, buddy. Yeah, hi. Uh, I have a question. It may sound like a, a strange question, but there are places where I don't want bees to congregate, uh, for example, around my doors or windows. Uh, is there something that you can use using essential oils that's like a bee repellent for that type of situation or, you know, something like Be Quick that's How cheaper? far is your hive from your house? Oh, I'd say about a hundred yards. Do you have a water source close to the bees? Yes, we do. Okay. Do you got salt blocks sitting around? No, I do not. Those are usually the two things. Uh, when they come up around a house, usually when you're out there sweating and temperature's up, they're actually looking for the salt on your body. Throw a salt block out there by a tree or something, and that's going to help a lot. Okay. Um, what about essential oils? Is there Are there certain essential oils that are repellent? Well, you can put citronella in there, but if you're a beekeeper, you, you don't want to make bees. You don't want to drive them off. Right, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's the, I just don't want them, you know, around the door or the window area, things like that. Well, um, are you I was trying to figure out a way. You got no, a hummingbird? No, I'm not feeding hummingbird. No. Well, it could be something right around your house that the bees are smelling that are coming up. All right, well, I'll double check, but I just want to see, since you talked about essential oils, yeah. about attracting. Uh, I didn't know if you knew of any that maybe uh, kept them away. Well, the citronella I know will keep them away. It keeps mosquitoes and other things away, but if I was a beekeeper, I wouldn't want it on my property personally. Right. The bees okay. are trying to well, find just... something. They're lacking something out there. Yeah, they actually, you know, were coming up close to the house even when it was cool weather, uh, you know, lower 50s, things like that. I, it's not too bad. It's just uh, something that I've been thinking about uh, if there is a way to do some, do do it naturally um, where it wouldn't hurt the bees. It'd just keep them away certain areas. You must have to have something around the house because we have loads of bees here and we'll shake out 50 packages and you got three pounds of bees in each package. We shake them out and within 24 hours there's hardly any bees up by my house. Now, when we pull in four or 500 okay. packages, there might be, you know, quite a few hanging around the carport for a while until they, you know, they drift up into a hive. Yeah, I was wondering how you, you know, kept them out of the, away from those places, but uh, there must be something that I'm, I haven't found yet uh, that's attracting them. So I'll, uh, when I'll are pay they, more you attention most to know, Notice them. Uh, when it gets colder, uh, below 50 or you know, cool weather. It's it's That's hard to I say. I would think you had something around the house attracting them. Sometimes people, yeah. things that they cook attracts bees. Well, I don't really, yeah, that could be it. Uh, I don't really have a problem when I'm feeding, mm -hmm. uh, you know, during the rest of the time of the year. It's just this fall, I noticed that a little bit. But well, uh, I'll keep that in mind. Strange. All right, well, uh, at this time, that's really the only question I had at this point. Okay. I appreciate it. Okay. Linda, did you have a follow-up to that? I thought your hand popped back up. Uh, um, we had a problem last summer with the bees coming around our swimming pool all the time when the kids were wanting to get in it, and I took peppermint essential oil and mixed it with water and sprayed around the parameter of the pool, and they went away within minutes, and it didn't hurt any of them. It just made them stay away from the pool. So you might try that. Do you use a chemical treatment or do you use salt treatment? It was salt in the pool, salt water pool. Yep. But that peppermint oil just sprayed around the perimeter of the pool that the bees went away. You see what I've just mentioned about the salt block? Right. Take a couple salt right. blocks yep. out and that yeah. will help a lot. Yeah. But for him, he might try that around his windows or whatever because it worked great for us. Just It didn't kill any of them. It just made them go away and leave us alone. Yeah, okay. I'll keep that in mind. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Pat, Leon, did you guys have something to add to that? Well, 
uh, one of the things that you can try is if you put some kind of blockade in front of the entrances, like some uh, piece of privacy fencing, they come out of the hive and fly up over the fence. They don't come back down until they get to the nectar source. So it gets them a little higher up in the air and kind of distracts them from your house. Uh, but I think that they can, they know where the sugar's coming from. So you might just need to um, feed more heavily or there's something missing out in the yard, like Don said, because uh, ours hang around the doorknobs until we carry food out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I live in a I live in the beautiful Ozark Mountains, and I'm up on a hill above where my bee yard is. So yeah, that's um, I, I'll try a little bit of that peppermint as an experiment, see what oil essential oils they like, what they don't, um, and I'll, I'll just go from there. But if anybody has some good ideas on that, uh, I'd appreciate it. Okay. See, uh, Justin Miller. Go ahead, buddy. Yeah, real quick question going back to. If you're using starter strip, is there, if you use small cell starter strip, obviously they're going to build below that whatever whatever they want, whether it be 5.1 or whatever they need, uh, even for drone. Um, do you move the, are you using just uh, full sheets of foundation or are you using starter strip and then moving that out after they, they raise some brood or what? No, what we're doing usually in the summertime, we're feeding really heavy. Uh, I have done it both ways. I've used half sheets. Uh, this year, we've just done about 300 frames and they got an inch to an inch and a half starter strip in there because mm -hmm. the honey flow is going to be pretty heavy early and I want to burn the honey up. I don't want them storing honey. I want them to use the honey to make wax. Uh, I'm in it for basically for making bees. Right, right. Last year, we experimented around with full sheets and half sheets. The full sheets, if the honey flow is too heavy and you don't use fiction line, the foundation starts to get so heavy, it'll bag over against the frame next to it. And then you end up cutting out a frame and you're wasting resources there. So we found by a starter strip, they just draw a lot better and stronger comb and it's straighter. Gotcha. I, my, I guess I was wondering about like for the, the brood nest, you know, making sure that you're raising, the, you got the smaller cells for mite control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we start, that's, we've been on small cells just ever since probably 90. So that's all we roll. Right, right. Yeah. You know, there's people that do do the blank sheet, just dip a sheet and then go from there. Mm -hmm. But then depending on what kind of bees you got, if you got large cell bees, they're going to draw a large cell or they might draw a bunch of uh, drone comb. Understood. So if you have already have the small cell and those bees are, are raised in small cell, they're going to automatically draw a small cell. Yeah, they've been at okay. it for generations. So if you bought a package from me and you bought a package from somebody else, there are going to be a noticeable difference. And, you know, the best people to ask is students that's been here, bought bees from me, that's, that's ran, you know, the large cell. Mm -hmm. That way they give you an unbiased opinion. But I've been at it for since 90 and you know, we roll out every time we start the press up down there, we probably do two, 300 sheets. Gotcha. All right, thanks Don. Okay. Pat and Leon, did you have something out of that? Yeah, Pat's uh, interested in the uh, Ross rounds and she had a couple questions on that. Okay. Um, I guess the, the first thing is when do you want to put your Ross Round Supers on as soon as you get a good honey flow? Or, uh... Well, if you put Ross Rounds on, you want to make sure you got enough boxes first, or you're going to have to use a queen excluder. Uh, you can't put uh, comb in the brood chamber that needs to be drawn out and have them draw out Ross Rounds. Now, Paul did it last year, and Paul had very good luck with it. One way we like to do it is we like to run a deep, a regular medium, and then we run two boxes of Ross rounds, and we put a gallon of honey on it. That way, we convert the honey right into Ross rounds. We triple our money right there, plus we draw the box out at the bottom. That's that's how we do it. But on a honey flow, I would have a box and a half, then put your Ross rounds. So as long as you've got that honey above them, they'll go ahead and move it into the Ross rounds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if uh, you pull your honey in the uh, 
in June or something, you can go ahead and take your uh, frames that aren't fully capped and extract them and put them in a uh, feeder for Ross rounds. Yep, we, we've done that quite a bit. But if you put your Ross rounds on, your honey has to be in a uh, half top feeder. You can't just put a box of supers above it and have, expect them to do anything with it, can you? Well, if you put it on entrance feeder and you're probably going to get robbing. Uh, high top feeder or a bucket feeder inverted works the best. <clears throat> but personally, okay. using the bucket feeders is faster. They draw out Ross rounds with a high top feeder 10 times faster because more bees can get to it. Where a bucket feeder, you only got two small holes. So mm -hmm. there's lots of ways to look at driving a horse down the road. Well, we want to do it the most effective. <laughs> well, that's the most effective way I found to do it. Um, uh, you like, have a lot of people say goldenrod honey is no good. I've got premium price, $25 a pound for goldenrod, just doing that very same thing right there. Extracting it and putting it in a high top mm -hmm. feeder? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Way to put the uh, Ross rounds together. Do you do anything different with them from the diagrams that comes with them? I really have never seen a diagram. I, <laughs> uh, my uh, most of the people buy kits. We buy Ross rounds. What they call it, bulk pack. They come like ten or fifteen supers, just the frames in there. And then we buy bulk rings and lids. Mm -hmm. Now the lids, I've tried both lids: the opaque and then the clear. I personally like the clear ones. The product sells much faster. The, the pressure sensitive labels, which you can get them in rolls and they roll right on. They're fast, they're handy, but I've seen people do them on a computer that are much better. Um, the uh, sheet of foundation that you put in the, uh, the frame. The uh, last round. If you, I've seen something where some people would put two sheets back to back so they could separate the, uh, and just have a single comb instead of a double comb. That doesn't make any sense to me. That's. It work. I'll tell you, what, you, know, you, you can buy what they call cut comb. It runs about yeah. 22, 23 sheets to the pound. We've mm -hmm. tried that. I've made the same thing on my wax mill. But now I put a starter strip through that Ross rounds. That way it's less chewy, even with cut comb. Oh, okay. I mean, oh, okay. you put a starter strip through there. All you have to do when you pull it out, you just take you a, a, like a paring knife and go around that circle and trim it, snap your lids on. Do that anyway, you're, yeah. You're good to go. And the okay. wax is a lot better. Yeah, so it's not so gummy in the middle. Right. No yeah. one wants to eat comb honey and chew it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> now you want it to spread good. <laughs> yeah. Them them biscuits. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good uh, good point. Great. Anything well, else? About these chats. If you yeah, ask, I give you the answer. <laughs> anything else to look out for with the Ross round? Well, uh, I have never froze them, but there's people that freeze them. Uh, they claim that they might get wax moth in there, but. If you're going to produce Ross rounds, you have a really strong hive. And I can't see, in my belief, that you're going to get wax moth in it. Mm -hmm. I don't think you wax keep it long enough. The hive is when the hive gets weak. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my cut comb sells so fast, I'm hoping that the Ross rounds aren't around long enough for the wax moths to take over. <laughs> One trick that, or tip that I can pass on with Ross rounds if you're going to pull Ross rounds, use very little or no smoke. Yeah. Uh, if you Good use flavor. smoke, they smell barbecue. And Stephen done that last year, and it was a learning experience. Oh, so the honey smells like smoke. It'll Tastes suck like smoke. that smoke smell, and you can't sell the product. Oh, huh. that's a good tip. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Well, we're going to give it a try this spring, try some of them. I do cut comb out of my top bar hives, but I can't produce enough, so I'm hoping with the Ross rounds it'll be a little extra. Well, the beauty part of the Ross rounds, if you're going to get into high-end comb, is no matter what size super you use, you can pull the center out, and if the other one's is not completely capped, you can replace the center, put it back on the hive, and they'll finish drawing it. If you get hog halves, 
that's all plastic foundation there. When you cut three or four or eight out of the middle of it, the rest is junk because there's no way you could fix it. And going back to the balsa, which is the cassette, the wood cassettes, we've done those in the 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the reason uh, they went to the Ross Browns. The rounds fill out better than the square boxes. And the square boxes, they always have the corners unfilled. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, well, we'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> Try them on the five frame boxes. They do so much better. And the product is, is a big seller. And you can get 12 and a half for it wholesale. Okay. Cool. All right, that's it. Okay. Okay, let's see. We got a good roll tonight. <laughs> Raina, uh, Raina, go ahead. Hey, Don. Um, just a question about uh, foundationless. Have you tried that? Uh, what are your thoughts about uh, foundationless beekeeping? Foundationless beekeeping? I right. mean, it depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, you've got to have something in there for the bees to draw. And if you're going foundationless, if you don't put the sugar to them, they're not going to draw a good comb. They're going to draw a lot of stretch comb, or they won't finish drawing comb out. you got to figure out where you're going to go and what you want to do. If you just want to throw one frame at a timing, yes, they'll draw it out, and usually they'll do it pretty good. But don't try to do a whole box. Um, starter strips, you could take one sheet and get six cuts out of it easily. So, you know, even if you're buying the foundation, buy brood foundation without wires in it and 10 sheets will be you know enough to do 40 or 50 boxes got it yeah all right thank you mm -hmm. okay pat leon yeah Go for ahead. Raina, um i've done foundation list i run top bar highs where they draw all the foundation themselves and they do but it takes a lot of resources so um, we have done starter strips, even in the top bar. Them something to start, and they get a better attachment at the top, which is where most of the support comes from, and no matter what kind of frame you have. But um, that starter strip at the top, they build a wider attachment, and they build the comb out in a better shape, and it's got more support. They will do it, um, but when you're first starting to transition over to foundation lists or going with the starter strips, you want to checkerboard it with some fully drawn out frames or you get a lot of wonky comb. You can't just give them an entire box of starter strips with a package of bees or you'll get a mess to begin with. They need a little bit of guidance. So if you have a, a frame from another box or you can checkerboard in and, and mix them up and you know, grow it out to eventually becoming uh, foundationless rather than trying to do an entire hive from the get-go. And yep. another thing, if you want to cut your foundation, your strips with starter strips, it's use the, uh, the deep uh, unwired foundation and just take a top bar and use that to line up across the top and a raised knife and just slip it, uh, cut it with, with the chop bar, and that makes it pretty out of a sheet of deep foundation. So. Straw frame. If you use that as your guide for cutting your starter strips. That's Makes all. Sense. Makes sense. Thank you. One thing that if you're going to cut foundation, uh, I would suggest using a frame. Uh, get you a steel square that works the best and then you see the finger it gets the end cut off with a box cutter use a <laughs> box cutter okay It'll do a lot better <laughs> that's where experience comes in handy right <laughs> thank you for sharing yeah <laughs> little tips yep thank you that's all i have okay Okay, if you've got questions, go ahead and uh, put your hand up. You can click on uh, the participants tab uh, and you'll see right there next to your microphone and video camera, the, the hand, just uh, click raise hand. We'll get your question in there. Uh, Don, in the meantime, I've seen uh, on your Facebook page, 
down in uh, Florida, they're already making queens. Yep. Uh, and they got drone cells coming out. And I, I know a lot of us uh, northerners up here sure get jealous. We're waiting on a decent snowstorm to come through and have a whole lot left of weather to go before we can uh, start doing that. The reason I, I brought that up is a lot of us who are getting started, we try to look uh, to patterns uh, and to weather and for timing and things to help us get an idea of uh, how soon we can get into making nukes, making queens. We can also make those things for sale and available. Uh, what have you seen? You've been beekeeping uh, for an awful long time and you've been doing a lot of it down there in North Georgia. Uh, over the course of, let's say, 10 years, 20 years, have you found that uh, you're within a week or two as far as timing year after year or is, has, is the weather getting so crazy to where it's, it's so, it fluctuates a lot? What are you seeing where you're at? Every year is a different year. I mean, four years or five years ago, we was grafting here at my house in February, had mated queens going out first of March. Now, a lot of years we can't do that. Stephen has done set up two of his uh, uh, nuke box yards down in my, our queen yards, which we're gonna set our first grafts in two weeks. That's gonna put the, you know three weeks after uh, from here. It'll be three weeks and we'll have uh, ripe cells to put in because we're gonna be making about 500 splits in a day and a half, two days. Um, the thing about the weather from my house where I'm living right now to our Southern yard, it's like going down the calendar four to five weeks. And then we have uh, some yards in Waycross. It's like jumping another three weeks. You could drive down the highway and you could see trees blooming. I mean, right now there's things blooming that we might have a really early year this year. I mean, it's, it's, no one can tell you, you know, every year seems to be different and just got to play the, la the averages. That's why, you know, if you're doing queens, if you only want five queens, do your 25. That way you, you have extra. Because that temperature Ohio, drops on you, it'll, it'll knock them cells down on you. Up here, we usually have like a real light flush of dandelions and then the apple blossoms kind of come on. And usually that's a pretty safe time up here. I know you've got different plants and things uh, down where you're at, but do you find you've got a certain uh, flower bloom or a tree that flowers that's about when you guys get going good? I heavy? try to watch red maples here. When the red maples are opening up, that is my signal here to get going. Down south, it's different. By the time our red maples are blooming, the red buds are already coming in good down there. Bradford pears are coming in. There's so many things that you just look at the seasons. Now, I originally moved from Ohio to Valdosta. I was 20 miles from the Florida line. We made queens 11 months of the year down there. And I mean, <laughs> that's got advantages, it's got disadvantages, you know? So you just have to work with the weather. Work with the weather and learn to look for those natural signs, I guess, and that because they'll tell you, you know, that, I guess that tells you what's what, what doesn't it? And you have to experiment because there's no beekeepers around that were going to tell you anything. I've learned everything that I had learned by a lot of mistakes. So I go out of my way doing these chats to help people so they don't make the same mistakes because the good beekeepers are slowly dying off and they don't want to pass nothing on. They take it to their grave with them. So if you know some, share it. Uh, that's, you know, it's not a big secret. I mean, I actually send business to every student. You can't make but so much. Uh, there's only so many hours in a day. You can only do so much. If I had the people here that would do it, we could do 10 or 20,000 queens a week. But you can't. Nobody's going to help. They want to get in there and go gun forth and, and, and make all the mistakes. <laughs> if you can find a good mentor that will teach you the old ways, get with it. Beat his door down. <laughs> Go to work that's, the, that's the ticket. That's the ticket. I've, I've, we've learned so much from you. It's, it's really uh, shot us forward at least 10 years ahead in the journey there. Uh, so I would totally agree with you on that one. Looks like uh, Ernest. Go ahead, pal. Try to unmute. There he goes. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, yeah, what I use is the when the apple trees uh, starts blooming, that's when I can start grafting. And, uh, you know, the weather determines uh, when it blooms, and when it blooms, uh, the weather's warm enough. Uh, you got to have it warm enough that those uh, 
bees can fly out and get mated and you got to have drones. So uh, you don't have the drones, you're not going to get them mated, don't matter how, how soon you can graft them. But I found out my uh, observational hive, it wasn't doing anything all winter and now it started about the 15th. It started taking honey and, and the center of it is hot. So they're starting to raise some babies a little bit right in the center of it. So that's awful early, but uh, like you say, the weather's uh, uh, changed so much this year. It's been so warm. So we'll probably slow it down this week. Uh, we got snow and we got some uh, colder weather, so that might slow them down. But if, uh, if it continues like that, all my outside hives will have to be real careful with them because uh, uh, Observational hive is taking feed, uh, uh, you know, quite readily, and I'm sure the outside hives will be doing the same. So, just something I gotta watch out for. And another thing, I was wondering if anyone uh, I mentioned last uh, time on the chat, uh, having your uh, honey at uh, at start to turn to sugar, uh, is I wonder if anyone uh, did that, spin into the honey and making the honey butter out of it. Uh, so uh, I just wonder if anyone might have used that. Uh, I think they're all starting to do bees now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's all I have, I guess, for now. Uh, I just said observe most of the time. I can learn more from listening than uh, talking. Hi, hi. <laughs> Well, now that we're talking about grafting, uh, there's a lot of different types of grafting tools that you can get out there. Uh, for a beginner, I would say invest in uh, those Chinese uh, grafting tools. Uh, one thing I would say is when we buy them, we buy 25. Or when I have students here, they ask me what to buy. I said, buy at least 25. If you buy 25 of those, you might find one, maybe three at the most in there that's really good. And if you get one that's a little too stiff, one thing you can do is put your finger on the top and extend that little tongue out and get some 600 paper and sand it good on both sides. That'll help it work a little better. Now, we've used the German, the, the stainless one. We've got several. I've got a, a paper clip out there that you can graph with, a piece of copper wire. So basically it's technique. The Chinese one, it works great for people just starting. But after you get going, you'll find something that you like the best. And we basically graft from uh, a frame that's got good populations in it. We don't add any extra um, rubble jelly to it. We just scoop up what's in there. If you're feeding them good before you graft, you will have plenty of royal jelly. Um, we tried buying royal jelly. Uh, it wasn't a great experience. Uh, you don't know what you're buying. And when you buy it, you still have to cut it. So even if you buy the smallest amount, you're going to throw three quarters of it away. Because royal jelly, when you get it, you're going to have to cut it 50% and then use it. But now there's people that there's a lot of different techniques. Some people put their cups in there 24 hours ahead, let them polish them, and then grafting them. We just use them right out of the cup. Right That's the way I do. I use them right out of the package and they work just fine. I've, I've had them where they were in there and, and polished and it didn't seem to make much difference one way or the other. So, uh, But uh, they always like that fresh comb, but it's fresh comb is very hard to, uh, to graft out of because you end up push right through the bottom. And no Chinese uh, grafting tools, I sand them down to the point you'll be using one and all of a sudden it'll split. So you got to throw it down and pick up another one. So <laughs> it's good to have a half a dozen or more of them uh, with you when you start uh, grafting. So you never know which one is going to work uh, properly for you. And if you're going to graft, best thing to do is get some darker comb. Uh, if you've got all new comb in there, it's going to be a lot harder to graft from, or you're going to have to have really good lighting in there. Uh, what we do when we're doing production, we take comb that's a chocolate color, and we take a hot knife and we cut it in half. Slice it right like you're extracting honey. You got a lower uh, angle that you have to reach in, and then you can go a lot faster. So there's no matter what you're getting into, there's a lot of little tricks that you can pick up. That's one that we use because the higher the cell, 
uh, it's harder to graft out of. Yeah, I bought some of those black plastic frames just mm -hmm. for that purpose because, uh, you know, you don't punch through the bottom of it. It's easy to get it out. And I did take the hive tool and just scraped off the things, and that works pretty good too. Mm -hmm. So, yep. uh, like you said, it's just kind of little techniques you learn so you can yep. graft faster because you got to do it fast before they dry out on you and get it back in the hive again. So. Well, you know, a lot of people talk a lot about the cells drying out and that. I've got them on the tailgate of my truck in hot sun. Uh, there's a lot of misbeliefs, misguided information out there. Uh, queen cells, they're not as delicate as what people think. And I probably mentioned it on one of my chats where I had a, a, a bowl that was an old cool whip bowl and there was about a hundred cells in there. And I had an old pickup truck I was driving on the bumpy road and I hit my brakes and that thing went on the floor. And I thought to myself, that's a lot of wasted queens, but I was almost at the bee yard. I put them in. I'll bet you I had 90% of them that did have. So once they're at a ripe stage, they're a lot more tougher than what people think. Um, I hear all kinds of little stories people tell me and sometimes I just think to myself, it's getting thick in here. <laughs> Well, I found out if I got them in there faster, I had uh, uh, better results. And, uh, you know, sometimes you'll... you'll from having your hive overpopulated, like where it's ready to swarm, then they will take the cells good. Yeah, if it, it lingers too long, uh, I found out they didn't, uh, I didn't get as many. So sometimes you'll start something and then something else will happen and, uh, you know, you got out of the hive... Uh, and uh, it just takes too long to do it. So, uh, how much? How what's what your population look like? How many frames would you put them in the five frame box for grafting? I put them in a five frame, and I uh, I really uh, build that hive up, you know, and shake a lot of extra bees in it, and uh, and uh, have it way overpopulated. But I only do it about three times. I don't know uh, how many times you do it before you repopulate it again. Oh well. It depends on how you're populating it. You've got an established hive, you've been grafting out of it. We try to shake uh, new bees every other graft. Now, when we set up brand new here for showing students, we do three pound packages. And I dump two packages into a five frame box that's drawed comb. And then students will look at me and the bees are just piled up thick on the front. They say, no more is gonna fit in there. And I take another package and I dump it in there. And then I pull the center frame out the next day and throw the graft in there. And you'll get 95, 98%, at least all the time. But feed them while you're doing it. And, you know, oh, have yeah. to go home. But now, you know, when we, we reshake for to build the nurse bees up, uh, if your nurse bees are getting two grafts, three grafts, then they're less likely to produce enough royal jelly to, to make good queens. So we usually shake three to four extra frames in front of the hive. I've had videos out there where I shake bees in, the, in front of the hive and people say, why don't you shake them in the hive? Well, I'm trying to shake them in front of the hive to put the field bees into the air so they go back to the parent hive. And then I have nurse bees in there. So that's <clears throat> the reason why I do that. A lot of people don't understand why I'm doing something. They think I'm wasting bees on the ground. Yeah, they get old. Uh, when they get old, they're, they're forgers. They're no longer nurse bees. So. Yeah, well, maybe I'll do that instead of, uh, you know, I just usually turn them into a nuke and then start over again. Mm -hmm. yeah. You've got to keep that new population going here constantly. <clears throat> okay, that's all I have for now. Okay, I, I would just add to the grafting uh, dialogue there. Uh, I, I'm not good at grafting uh, at all. I mean, I had these big fat fingers uh, and I got young eyeballs. But what I did figure out is, hey, Don's got them. Uh, I took a page from Don's book, uh, several of them actually. Uh, but the one I'd rec also recommend is if, if you do have a female in your life, whether it's your wife, a daughter, a granddaughter, a sister, and they're, they kind of want to get involved with, with uh, grafting, there is definitely something to a female's touch uh, grafting with their eyeballs and how delicate they can get in out there. Uh, my wife is great 
fantastic at grafting. So she handles all that for us um, when it comes to grafting uh, larvae. So uh, it, it would be a great, good way to include uh, somebody uh, with, with your beekeeping if, if you have someone in your life that, that might fit the bill. So if, you, if you're trying it, uh, you know, when I first started, I, w- I was buying one or two of those grafting tools and they were always junk. And I didn't realize that for a long time. And then I just finally realized that I can't really do it that well. And then would buy several of those tools at a time. And then my wife took over and just has the knack. So don't give up. Uh, if that's something that you really want to do, there's, there's always uh, more than one way to skin that cat there. So, uh, uh, Dennis Crutchfield has a question for you, Don. He's uh, scouting a yard uh, down in uh, South Florida, maybe towards Miami. His question is, if you know of uh, any Africanized bees uh, down towards Miami. Yep. <laughs> From yep. Orlando, there you go, South, Dennis. be careful. Jacksonville has got some re- reports over there. You know, if you're going to take bees down there, be very careful, very careful. Because if you get some Africa's genetics and you haul them back to your home yard, you're going to fight for a year or two getting that genetics out of there. And if you can't work bees, what fun are they? Not very. But now, going back to grafting now, you know, there's a lot of people who use plastic. Uh, if you... If you do use a Chinese grafting needle, you're not going to tear the cell up if you use that Chinese. Uh, if you're using a wax one where you make it yourself, you can use like a paper clip. And what I like to do is when I put the larvae in there, I push a little pressure down on the paper clip and I make a ridge into the cell cup. And then as I back drag, it lifts that larva right up. And you have a less problem there where on the Chinese one, now, if you're not careful and you flip that larva upside down, it's not going to do anything. It's going to drown, basically. So th- when you look at that larva, it has to come off of the graft and needle in the same way that it, you picked it up. A lot of people don't understand that part of it. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gilmer, go ahead, sir. Hey, Don. Uh, I'm uh, feeding in the wintertime. Mm-hmm. I've got dry sugar on them, and I've also got five-gallon buckets out doing open feeding. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that good to keep both out there for all winter? If they're taking it uh, and you don't have really – except right now we're getting down into the 20s, so I wouldn't be feeding unless, unless you put dry sugar on. So, you know, you're in Texas there, so you probably have a lot warmer weather than what we have. In. We're getting down up to 30s and – 40s right now. Uh, the lowest I think we've had is about 30. Yeah, I, I wouldn't put no moisture in them. I, I'm not putting it on the inside. I've got dry sugar on the inside, but I've got the moisture in the bucket yeah, cleaner. Got, Should I take that away? And it's uh, mixed water in it. It's going to take it back to the hive, and they have to evaporate it. And when they start to evaporate it, it just puts all that moisture all through the house. It's like fogging your house with a moisturizer. That's what I was worried about. Yeah, okay. I'll be careful about that. Lift the back of your hive up. If it's got weight to it and you've got sugar on it, I mean, I wouldn't worry about feeding right now. Get up about okay. 48 degrees, 50 degrees before you start worrying about feeding them. Okay. Also, uh, I caught just a little bit of the uh, two weeks ago with the chat. You said something about the heavier sugar to or the heavier syrup Mm-hmm. to help them build the comb better right okay so you know everybody's going to tell you a different thing if it would work i would be doing it and we're using about a four to one a pre-mix and we right. don't need it. i mean it goes into the can if you open up the cans that come in the package that's the same material that we're putting in the high feeders so the less water you put in that hive the better off and there's less water they have to evaporate to use it. Okay. I'm looking at fixing me a mixer here in the next couple of months before springtime to use a tote and then come in and put the sugar in the hot or warm water in with it to, and then just put a sump pump in it to circulate it to mix it. Uh, I think I can get it thicker that way and still not kill me time-wise getting everything done, I'm hoping. 
Well, that's one thing that we used to do. We used to buy five or six totes, you know, every couple of weeks of that dry sugar. And when mm-hmm. you start knocking four hours, you know, two or three days a week, and just mixing, it's a lot of wasted time. For the difference between 12 cents to 17 cents for dry sugar versus 21 to 24 cents, you can make the difference up in just two nukes. So move on and keep going. <laughs> Don't look back. <laughs> I mean, right. a lot of people will look at it and they kind of laugh, but you save a little time here and a little time there. At the end of the day, you've gained a day. And I need that right now since I'm still working at my regular job. <laughs> you've got three days to get done what you have to do in a week then. Right. Absolutely. That's all I've got. Okay. 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 Uh, let's see. Linda, go ahead. You might have to unmute yourself there. Okay. There you go. All right. I want to know what you think about the horizontal hives. I've been reading a lot and really thinking about trying those. Mm-hmm. Not the top bar. But, huh? Do you want to make money in bees? I, I just want to keep them alive. That ain't the question. Well, there, I'm looking at it from a, a logistic standpoint. Those boxes are so heavy. And I've looked at those horizontals where I don't have to have all those boxes stacked on top because I'm generally doing it by myself. Well, I mean, I don't know of anybody that makes a living selling bees that runs horizontal or top bar hives. Okay. If you've got one or two hives, you like to play with them or something different. I mean, it's, you know, people don't like to hear what my opinions is sometimes. But if you come up and you tell me up ahead, I'm putting bees in a top bar hive, I would just send you down the road and let you buy them from somebody else because <laughs> that is the headache. Most okay. people build a top bar hive, they have no wax, they have no nothing in there, they dump the bees in there, and they think like they did 30 years ago. Well, the bees can forage. If there's nothing coming in and there's nothing out there from the eat, the bees leave, whose fault is that? It's the beekeeper that sold you the bees. But the horizontal's not like the top bar. You're putting the frames in there, you're just going horizontal instead of vertical. You're talking about an AZ hive? Well, it's the horizontal Langstrom is what they call it. I've been reading about it that, that instead of going boxes on top, it's like four foot long and you just work your way across. But uh, be honest now. Have you been out in the woods? Have you ever seen a four foot tree? No. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. Well, I just had to ask. Well, you know, you can do it. You can play with it. Mm-hmm. But bees have a tendency to build vertically, not horizontally. Okay. So, you know, you know, people that have a top bar hives requires, I think, a lot more uh, maintenance to them. You know, if you have, uh, if you got two of them, you're going to spend more time. Uh, AZ hives, people talk about AZ hives. That is where you got to buy a hive. It's, it's got a uh, rounded top bar and a rounded bottom bar. You basically got to buy the frames from that manufacturer. Oh, I don't yeah. see a uh, advantage to it other than if you're selling people that stuff okay mm-hmm. all right but you know I'm looking at it for what I'm doing is teaching as a commercial mm-hmm. you're not going to make money doing that okay thanks okay all right well, Don it you uh, me and get you one <laughs> it just hit uh, nine o'clock and I looks like that's all the questions unless you have anything else to uh to add in there, Don. Well, I've got them all buffaloed, I guess. Now, I thought he'd going to be a lot of questions tonight. No questions? We'll call it. I think night. we got hey, to them all. Hey, like, Don. Yeah. Are you still planning on coming to Texas? Yeah. Are you still planning on coming to Texas? Yeah. As far as I know, uh, it should be sometime the second or third week in April. I should be at Kelly's B Yard in Winding Way. Eight prairies, I'll be two days out there, one day training at each place. Good. Look forward to seeing you again. Okay. Hopefully. Don, we got uh, two, two last quick questions came in. Now. Let's see. Um, Patrick Rosales, go ahead. 
What what's the question? Dollar income. Oh. That again? Can you hear me? Uh, I was wanting to know if, if beekeeping could replace my full time job uh, at about sixty thousand uh, a year. Well, if you had enough hives, bees yeah. are selling. You figure if you're doing packages at one hundred and fifteen dollars a piece. You do 50 or 60 uh, packages a day, it adds up. Working for yourself, I think, is a lot better than working for somebody else. You go in there and they're yeah. up, and they would say this, you hit the road. If you, if you, my advice is if you don't enjoy beekeeping, and you don't love it, and you're doing it for the money, keep your regular job or keep your money in the bank. <laughs> Uh, I, we got uh, ten hives out there now, but you know I was wanting to do something like this for you know full time living. Best thing to do is watch the chats, talk to some of my students, and where where are you at? Missouri. Missouri. Dennis Crutchfield's over mm -hmm. there. There's two or three other people over there. Uh, Herbert's I've over there. To that's, that's them. I mean, your biggest thing is if you've got a table saw and you can build your stuff, build everything yourself. You know. I would even build frames. I did that, you know, back in the, the 60s and the 70s. But right now, you know, time-wise, you can buy them so cheap by the thousand. All right. Well, thank you. Okay. Okay. Looks like another question here. Uh, Bobby? Go ahead, Bobby. Dan, I'm looking for your unbiased opinion on Russian bees. My unbiased opinion. Yep. I don't. I don't run a Russian base. <laughs> I know, but what is it? Just the temperament. Well, I I had them here at one time. I teach. I don't run bee suits here. If students want to wear a bee suit in 80, 90 degrees, they can do it. Uh, to me, my experience has not been a a happy experience with them. All right. Has it been short lived or has it been an extensive experience? I don't know about that. <laughs> I mean, have you run more than a, just a few hives of Russian bees that you had to get rid of or was it? I actually bought breeders. Okay. Breeders that I paid 350 bucks a piece. I had 10 of them and I'm not going to say any more. Wow. All right, all right. If you can't work your bees, you're not going to make money. Okay. So, Get bees that you can work. That's the main thing. Uh, I've had students here that would come. They think they have to wear a bee suit, and usually within a half an hour, they come out of their bee suit. So if you can't work your bees, they're going to get where you can't work them. And you keep putting it off, and then they're going to die on you, and they're going to get mites and everything else. So uh, you have to read between the lines. You know, people say they don't have to treat this bee. They don't have to treat that bee. You're either going to have to split your bees, no matter what kind of bee you got. You're going to have to split, break that mite cycle. You're going to have to treat. You're going to have to do something. If it's minor or it's made, you've got to do something. Bees are not uh, well, I appreciate the advice. The 50s, 60s, and the 70s. That makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Don, Don does have uh, – he has one hive of Russian bees. Uh, and it's fun to watch uh, new students who who see that hive for the first time, and you'll walk in the front yard there, and you'll see a box, and it says Russians. Uh, and so everyone has the, the 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 stigma that they're about to get ate up and tore up, uh, and you don't say anything; you just let them work, and then they work the hive, and they open it up, and everything's calm, and everything's fine, and they realize it's it's just a box that says Russian, just to keep you on your toes. You know, we, a lot of times read too much into things we, we overthink we overanalyze we will take someone's word who maybe doesn't have the experience but uh that's it's always fun to see that that russian hive there at don's place <laughs> yeah we run several different lines a few years ago and you have to find a happy medium that you're going to be able to work we tried running russians in one yard tried running carniolans we tried running italians now we just have a mixed breed that you can work. It's a honeybee. That's what people call what kind of bees you got? Honeybees. <laughs> That's what I have. So, you know. But, you know, if you're going to improve your line, buy bees that you know the reputation of a breeder. 
Now, you can buy bees from a lot of people that's raising breed bees and you get certain genetics. And those are the genetics you're looking for. That's what you buy. You don't need to buy breeder queens unless you're selling uh, a lot of bees. Uh, production queen, basically out of anybody's yard, is a laying queen. That's basically all you need. If you're going to learn to graft, that's what you get. When you get to where you can graft and get 80, 90 percent, you want to buy a breeder queen and run one particular uh, breed of bees, then that's what you do. But when you start putting out $350 in there and you get in there and you kill that breeder, that's a lot of profit going down the tubes. It's like you don't go out and buy a $100,000 motorcycle and you don't know how to ride a motorcycle. You go buy a jalopy and you get on that and you balance and learn how to fall a few times. Then you get on the good one. Or you get an old beater and you drive it, you don't get your Ferrari first, unless you're rich. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a couple more hands here, Don. Let's see. Yeah, now we got them coming. Now we got them fired up. Uh, Ernest, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I had uh, Russian, and uh, uh, I was mowing, and I, I didn't come within about 30 feet of them and, uh, with the big tractor, and uh, and one went in my ear, and one went up my nose, and <laughs> and uh, I said, that's it with the Russian. So uh, the Italians robbed them out, and I said, good riddance. I, I didn't want no more Russian bees. And I couldn't even go in the yard. If I was up in the uh, garden and I'd run a rotor tiller, they'd be bouncing off of you. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, they they sound good, you know, uh, the write-up and everything on them. But it, like I say, if you can't work them, you know, what good is it? Well, so. have you noticed the write-ups that people do that a lot of these things you read, people is writing these books? You get in there and do a little research. The guy that's wrote these books, he's got five hives. Half of them die every year, but he keeps buying new bees, but he's an expert. And then there's people that say, these bees, are they, you never have to treat them. You don't have to do nothing. And then he's got these hives out here now that you don't have to do nothing. You just open the spigot, and the honey just runs right out the front. You don't have to do nothing else. So, you know, you've got to read the propaganda between it. Beekeeping is hard work. So if you don't want to work, don't get into bees. Leave your money in the bank or put it in a shoebox somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I like bees that can work. Uh, the ones I got from you, they, they're they nice and calm, and uh, I work them. Uh, I usually put a veil on, but I don't have to have gloves and so forth on. So uh, uh, just in case you get in one, if you do something wrong uh, and uh, you pick up a, a frame or something and accidentally drop one, you know, then the bees get a little upset. So. Well, see, I don't, never have I bragged about my bees, you know. I have people come here and are saying that the bees are gentle or this or that. You know, there's nobody, you know, you say, you shake your bees, you made them mad, you know, you're, you're too rough with them. I've had people out here say that that's going to cause them to sting. And I've had people come here, one-year beekeepers hold funnels, and I've shook their own packages in front of them, and they didn't have a bee suit on there, so... There's a lot of misinformation there, and then each person down the line. It's like when you tell someone in, in a grade school, there's five people, and you tell one person something, he passes it to the next one, and by the time it gets to the other line, at the end of the line, it's, it's totally a different thing. Same thing in beekeeping. Talk to people who make a living at it. Talk to people who are successful. You know, anybody can tell you how, how much honey they make, but they buy bees every single year. They, they, they got that loss figured into their profit. Well, if they buy 100 packages, well, 50 of them, 60 of them are going to die every year. So we just have our order in standing order. They have to be worked. They're like tools. You put them out in the woods, they ain't going to be there. Yeah, I had the Carnolians, and I uh, went to pick up a lid, and it stuck, and then it dropped. And I said, boy, they're going to be mad when I open that up. And that's just as calm as could be, so... Mm -hmm. It depends on the bees. Yeah, you, know, you got the right, right, uh, uh, tight bees. You can work them. If you're going to get into beekeeping and, and you're going to sell bees, plan on in investing in stock about every third year. Second, third year is good. If you buy bees and they're gentle this year, and then you start breeding them back, you've got inbreeding going on in the second and third year. Then they're going to get really mean. So that's why 
You know, I mentioned on all the chats, I have to buy breeder stock all the time. I have to improve my genetics so I don't get inbreeding. That's the main thing in beekeeping. Keep that inbreeding up. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Pat, do you guys have something out of that? The, I don't ever kill queens. I save them. I put them in a nuke. I baby them. Except I killed the Russian queens. I bought two Russian queens and I had them for two years. And the, I didn't find that mine were terribly aggressive, but mine were just starting spring buildup when honey flow was over. They were later starting to build. They don't keep as much brood through the winter was our experience. And so I just did away with them because by the time they got started, I was done and ready to move on to the next project. Uh, so I killed them. I have them in alcohol and I use it for swarm traps. Um, and then for Linda, I have done the horizontal hive and I did not have a good experience with them. They're, um, you've got a limited amount of space to work in. So there's more manipulation and you still got the hard frame around it. So you've got, they're saying that you can put honey supers on and all that, but you can't because you still got to put a lid on them for iterations. Um, I didn't have, I do have top bar hives. I have three of them, but they are my pet project that I do for cut comb honey. Um, they're very successful but there's a little bit different management style and so if you're trying to make money and do a lot of bee sales you're not going to get it out of top bar hives and top bar nukes are harder to make because there's not as many bees in a smaller nuke box it's harder to get them to be successful a lot more time management than they need if you're trying to make money off of bees it just is hard to do um and they're, they're in a limited space again so you don't have the room to have honey supers added on. And yeah, you can build things that make it so you can put honey supers on. But if you got to go to all that extra work, why not just go to eight frame medium equipment, which is what I run. It's 30 pounds and I can lift that on my own. I can't lift a, a deep. And so that was my decision making on the size of the equipment that I use was eight frame mediums. And the good thing about that is a new uh, brood box or a honey super, whatever, it's all the same size box. And so I and switch frames out and my boxes, all my woodenware is the same. It, you have to have less woodenware on hand that way. Um, so when I'm building up in spring and adding honey supers, if I need a box, I can go pull out from boxes that I've got, they're all the same size. So I'd go looking at uh, eight frame medium or the five frame nuke sizes, Don's uh, suggesting that. The only problem I've had with the five frame nukes is if you're gonna try and get honey, they get so tall <laughs> because you've got to have two or three for brood and then a couple of honey supers on the five frame nukes. It gets kind of tall and I'm a short person. So that's a little bit hard to work. But the eight frame mediums worked really well. Um, but yeah, don't do the Russians. And for the guy that was talking about making money, absolutely there is money to be made in bees, but not for a first year beekeeper. And if you want to go commercial, you need to sign up and take Don's commercial class. Ask the guys that are already students. They'll tell you the same thing. You have to know all those little tips and tricks if you're uh, wanting to come out making money in a few years. And that's all. If you get started the right way, work for a commercial beekeeper and learn that way or, or find you somebody will teach you. But don't listen to a lot of people that, you know, if you want to make a million, you got to spend three million, you know. The majority of people, if you listen to half of what I'm telling you, just half of it, you'll be in the black the first year. But if you listen to a lot of yahoos out there, you're going to be in the red for four or five years. You're disgusted. Yeah, you can, you can absolutely get in the black uh, year one and all these things, you know, Trying to put a dollar sign to exactly what you need to get out of it is uh, all a matter of context and a matter of scale. Uh, and that determines, you know, how much money you have to initially invest in it, uh, customer base, uh, and then the, the actual learning curve. Uh, and a lot of those things, uh, learning from Don in person, uh, it, it takes uh, that learning curve out by even, even as far as a decade. 
So if, if you are on the fence uh, and you do want to sell bees, uh, definitely invest uh, in yourself uh, first and foremost, the time to go down to learn from Don uh, because it will literally shave off uh, not only uh, the, some of the learning curve and the time it takes to do it, but you all, you'll save yourself a lot of money uh, and a lot of headache. Uh, and when you're first getting started, there's so many things you just have no idea. It just thing, small things like how to put a new together, what, how, how to size that correctly, how to shake a package, things that unless you're learning or you're a, a multi-generational beekeeper and you've learned from your granddad or an old mentor, you're not going to know how to do those things. And it gets very, very intimidating. So it's, it's really important to find somebody who is willing to share, uh, who, do, who does want to see you uh, succeed and do well and, and do like what Don's doing. Don's passing the torch down uh, to all of us, especially some of us youngsters. Uh, it's what we're teaching our kids. We're teaching our community. Uh, and that, that old time way of beekeeping will live long, long, long because of that. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, most of you have heard me go on and on and on uh, about that. But, um, you know, we, we, we have bees for sale this spring. And so do other uh, Don students because we've learned from Don uh, and we've done that in short order. Uh, so I see Hubert there with, with, with his thumbs up, Victor, uh, him and his dad, Eric, there, that's the same thing on and on. There's, there's uh, Pat, there's so many folks uh, even on this chat, folks that are listening that have learned directly from Don. Uh, and you've heard him say, if you do 10% of what he says, I mean, you'll, you'll, you'll be successful. Uh, so that's, uh, I can't say enough uh, good things about that. I would say, Don, uh, we're, we're at um, uh, 17 minutes past. Uh, we're in mid. Yeah, we're in, we're in overtime here. Uh, and by the time this gets released and back on the inner tubes, we're going to be uh, late January. I would say by the time folks are actually listening to this, uh, if they are going to be, if they do want uh, packages or nukes from you uh, and they already haven't placed their order, I would probably say they want to get on that ball pretty quick uh, because the time is running out real fast. And as far as training, you know, get on Dixie B Supply, look under Don's Keepers, talk to some of my students. Sometimes they'll take somebody that's close by and work something out with them. Maybe they'll give you a better price for classes, work out, you know, some kind of trade, put some labor in, sweat equity. I mean, you can learn, and my students will pass on stuff that I've taught them. There's little things, like, like Greg says, the little thing, holding a high tool, opening a box, the way you stand on the, from the box or the side of the box. There's a lot of little things that there's not wrote down in books. You have to pick it up from someone. you got to learn it from somebody. You might as well learn from someone who's actually doing it. Uh, and that way, you know, you're not just passing on, you know, some piece of cheap information that you've just found on Google or on Facebook. You're actually learning credible information from someone who uh, can really back up what he's saying with the experience. Uh, that's, that's really helpful. So thanks, Don, for everything that you do. Uh, again, thanks to E for keeping the, the, ch the chats going and all the work he does behind the scenes to make all this possible for us. Don, unless you have anything else to add here, I'd, I'd say we're probably ready to stop the recording and uh, head into the head to the, uh, the after chat. Okay. I enjoy everybody coming and get your questions. You know, if you don't ask the questions, we, we can't teach you nothing. You know, don't sit there and say, well, it's a dumb question. You know, I started out too. Everybody else does. We got to make mistakes or get good information and go from there. So I appreciate everybody showing up and we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks for hosting tonight, Greg, and have a good night. You bet. We'll see you guys.